This is the first time that we have done an event like this. This is a chance to highlight the, I don't want to say less scholarly because that has sort of a like negative tone, but the more creative work that the journal publishes, um, specifically works of creative nonfiction and fiction and poetry. Um, we've never done a public reading of any kind. So this is the first time we've done one, and this is obviously the first time that we've uh, done something where we cho choose to emphasize the, the not strictly academic work that is a part of what the journal does. So I'm super excited. Um, everybody who's going to read tonight has work that was published in the journal within the last few years. Um, Did you leave me two bagels? Wait, what? Anyhow, everyone, I don't know what that was. Everyone who will read tonight um, has work that has been published in the journal in the last few years. Uh, I posted a quick lineup in the chat that lists who's reading, what they're reading, and which issue of the journal it was published in. I would encourage you, if you don't already do this or have not done this, uh, check out the journal online. We are at confluence-aglsp.org. Uh, the journal does not exist without the great people who are submitting and without the great people who are reading. So please be one or both of those kinds of people. That's about it. I do hope that we will have time at the end and interest to have kind of a conversation with and about the work that we hear. But first, our priority is going to be to make sure that we give the readers ample time to read. So we will have a reader go, we will then move on to the next one and we will save questions and discussion until the end. Um, and with that, we will start with Brian Eckert, uh, who was an alum of Johns Hopkins University, and he's re reading his poem, uh, Spoopy Tejas. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, Dr. Burr, and thank yeah. you, Kim and Amy and everyone for setting this up. Um, yeah, so as Stephen said, I'll be reading um, my poem, Spoopy Tejas, tonight. Um, it's a collection of writing I did on my way to the um, conference in San Antonio in the fall. Um, I drove down from Boulder, Colorado and did some camping. Um, so it's a collection of notes from that trip. Um, Spoopy Tejas, howdy, everyone in Texas, including the rattlesnakes. Today, I woke up in New Mexico and drove through Texas all morning to get to New Mexico. I climbed the equivalent of a 70 story building up and down into a cave or maybe cavern. I don't know the difference. The entrance smelled of shit like a petting zoo or pet store. Swallows rose up in a whirlwind swirling in spirals into the sky, but the cavern is so large. It has its own sky. It breathes the earth. It is the earth breathing. Slippery conditions exist. Jim White discovered Carlsbad Caverns when he noticed smoke rising from the horizon on his farm, so he rushed over to check it out, but it was actually a colony of bats, so he came back with a ladder, some rope, candles, and oil. It was part of his journey to find and explore the cave. Then they started mining shit literal shit like bat guano hundreds of thousands of pounds came out of those bats and eventually the cave to fertilize dry soil swallows build nests held together by saliva new mexican nursery equals correct combinations of food plus water plus shelter plus plenty of space and safety bats gestate for 90 days cleaning the newborn, sticking it to the ceiling, waiting eight to 10 years to die. All they have to do is mate, maybe even a few times. Then they're just living life, being bats. 
Is that the purpose of life for Christians and bats? Be fruitful and multiply, eat fruit and die. Bats flow upward, silent and sparse, through faint rain. Is this a murmuration? Bats are not birds. They give live births, milk through armpits, or maybe wing pits. In this month of Halloween, bats migrate south for margaritas and beaches, or maybe just stable sources of food. The whirlpool of wings vigorously rises into evening showers for moths mating at 10,000 feet, for insects in Carlsbad, for a warm Mexican winter. These ain't no city bats. These bats need their space. These bats, these flippin' bats. Today, I drove through Uvalde, Texas. There were still signs and memorials, still pain and mourning and suffering, still news crews using the school as a backdrop, still no solution, remedy, or good faith political action. When I moved to Colorado in August, 2022, I thought about all the mass shootings as I drove south on I-25, Aurora, 12, Columbine, 15, Boulder, 10, and now Colorado Springs, 5. Indiana sure loves guns, but I guess everyone is angry and xenophobic, xenophobic in the same general direction where they leave, like me. The Midwest is a marsh beavers won't inhabit. Poets, or rather, all artists, are the keystone species of society, sensitive to disruptions in the harmonious order, to changes or shifts in tone, to rising hostile tides, to growing stifling conflicts. It is a risk to choose between slow suffocation or the dangerous volatility of somewhere better. So I have cigarettes for breakfast and take Sisyphean camping, Sisyphean camping trips and take inconsistent psychedelic trips and hike until my feet bleed and hike until my hands and knees also bleed. I can't stand the frustrations of both my own problems and everything on the nightly news and everything on the local news and everything with my family and everything in my past and overcoming all those everythings every day, but I endure lightning storms in tents and flash floods in riverbeds, plump rattlesnakes and rutting bison, cancer and chemotherapy, addiction, alcohol poisoning, and all chemical inclinations. It's flippin' bats, emerging in colonial swarm, billowing cigarette smoke of squeaks, irregular natural chaos in trickling puffs like clouds roll over Guadalupe Peak, or condensation and sweat down my bare chest, serendipitously mixing in 1001 directions. Bats head south at 90 miles per hour while I'm stuck at 83 to keep the pigs from squealing and trying to steal my weed. Texas has road signs alerting, Roads may be slippery when wet, as if Texans had never experienced rain. Slippery conditions exist. Dead buzzards, dead possums, dead trailers, dead dogs, dead butterflies in my grill. Dead tired tires blown out. Dead trucks, dead houses, dead rattlesnakes flattened on the roadway. Dead pueblos that were killed to be rebuilt as churches that were also killed repurposed as houses, then finally surrendered to the federal government, all 20 miles from Eden, Texas. Surrounded by windmills and guilty stomach aches about all the classics I haven't read, Don Quixote, Moby Dick, the brothers Karamazov, Madame Bovary, Anna Karenina, Texas flattens out somewhere north of Eden, somewhere under cloud-free skies. I swear, officer, it's medicinal. Sir, that is crystallized LSD. How do you know? Whenever I need to fly across Texas, over the moon, to the tops of mountains, up to beehives for honey, to wherever the hell tea leaves grow, I've been driving for six hours and I'm still in fucking Texas. Okay, only four, but it will be six before I'm done. Fucking hell is 
New Deal Texas and Hale Center Texas. Repent and believe in Jesus Christ. It's so flat, I might start praying too. Happy Texas. Suffering exists. Somewhere, hopefully near the Oklahoma border, someone rides their horse to the liquor store in Stratford, Texas. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. I neglected to mention uh, that Brian's poem is, uh, you can read it in the current issue, which was just published online about a week or so ago. And uh, Spoopy Tejas is actually one of two poems that Brian has in this, in this issue. So if you have not already checked out the issue, I would definitely encourage you to do so um, and check out Brian's other poem. Thank you again, Brian. Uh, next up, we have Donna Grimley from Rice University. Uh, she's going to read a portion of her essay called The Ash Heap of Vanity. Uh, this was published in the fall 2022 issue, uh, so uh, last fall. And that this in its entirety is available online, but Donna will read a portion of it. Um. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. This essay attempts to reveal the artistic motivations of Graham Sutherland, a 20th century British artist. He was commissioned to paint Winston Churchill's portrait, which was to be hung in Parliament. The painting, however, never made it to its intended home. Certain portions of this essay are the artist's own musing on the artistic endeavor. Certain elements in nature seem to me to have a kind of presence. I won't go further than that and say it was a human presence or what kind of certain presence it was, but a presence. Shadows had a presence. Certain conformations of rock seemed to go beyond just being rock. They were emanations of some kind of personality. After the war, he visited the coast of Pembrokeshire and his imagination was sparked by the landscape. He did not see vistas per se, but saw the individual elements of the landscape as distinct subjects. The dendritic shapes which reached skyward and resisted the wind were necessarily shaped by its force. The roots matching the tree's shape hidden below ground clinging for dear life as they pushed around rocks and through dense clay to survive. Glorious rock formations were sculpted by water, wind, and sand over eons, replicas of the cliffs from which they had fallen. They lay like toppled statues on the shore. The resilience of these stones and vegetation, taking their forms from the buffeting of the elements, inspired him. His eye noted a gorse bush, which had taken root in a hollow of a boulder, clinging against all odds in a teaspoon of sand, which had accumulated therein. What produced this determination to live? Drawn to the struggle of boulders or trees against the pressures of nature, he was interested in human beings who had been pressed by life, not the young, unmarred, and untested. I am drawn towards a paraphrase in some degree or other in order to display more vividly the inner life and mystery of the subject. But the human face and body is even more complex and mysterious. One is dealing with a sentient breathing thing and in order to obtain a flavor, let alone the essence, I feel at least for the moment that I have to be as absorbent as blotting paper and as patient and watching as a cat. You touched his lips with the gentlest brush stroke, applying the paint so deliberately, and I knew you saw us. As the head, I speak for each member of the Churchill Corporeal Consortium when I say that you seem to observe what a toll it has taken on us to keep him going all these years, each pulling his weight, so to speak, each doing his part to keep that great hulk of a man going and a thankless job it was, I can tell you. 
He was particularly hard on Brain, whom he ordered around ceaselessly and never listened to a word she had to say. He had her retrieving and refiling files all day long. Occasionally, she took the initiative and presented him with images from the war of destruction or terror or suffering, just to see if he was listening. But it enraged him. He shackled her and told her that she no longer had free reign, but was now only allowed to give him what he asked for. He threw all of those images into a contempt pie and swallowed it. He drew nourishment from it to strengthen his resolve against Hitler. During the war, Stomach tried everything to scare him. Floods of bile, upward, quivering, nausea, all the usual tricks, but he wouldn't be moved. He just ate more steak and drank more scotch. Did you know that when he went to America during Prohibition, he had Dr. Moran write him a prescription for scotch to be drunk daily to make nerves be quiet? Lungs also tried three times shutting down the air sac so he couldn't get a good deep breath, but he just smoked more cigars, laughed and coughed. During the war, he sent feelings to his room and completely ignored the rest of us. With all of that locked up inside him, he still can't manage to sleep without the pills Dr. Moran prescribes for him. He told backbone, shoulders and neck that they would be expected to uphold the entire nation in the war against the Germans. And he didn't want to hear a peep of complaint. Mutiny tried, heart had attacks, brain tried smoke stroking, lungs filled with fluid and scream, but all he did was call Dr. Moran and order him to quell our insurrection. The doctor was assisted by Clementine who bustled us out of view whenever we were weak. She managed to hide us away for weeks from the queen herself just a few months ago when brain stroked again, and this time the big one, and knocked him flat. But he can't fool you. You've perceived it all underneath that stiff pose he insisted on holding these four weeks, facing you with that squared stance, legs apart, arms on each rest, braced for conflict. You reached for Wedgwood Blue and come straight for the eyes, vivifying these pale blue flaming beacons, which transmit his determination with the same intensity as they always have. You've caught the set of jaw, the spite skin's drapery. We heard him telling you that they're trying to oust him from chambers. They're calling for him to resign. If Mouth could speak on her own, she would tell them, no way is he ever gonna give in. He never, never, never gives in. And as he poses for you, he keeps insisting, they won't get rid of me, I am a rock. Good thing you're good with rocks. As the head of the body, on behalf of us all, we'd like to thank you for noticing us and portraying us which, with such dignity. You have seen the valor that we have shown, honored us by not averting your gaze, and presented us with clear-eyed admiration. There was no moon. A blanket of mist shrouded the garden and muffled the night noises. Two figures struggled up the stairs from the cellar with an unwieldy burden. It was a rectangular object, almost five feet by four feet, and the man and woman were further pressured by an apparent need to be silent. Hissed Grace. The other figure, her brother, was used to his sister ordering him about, seeing as she had done so for as long as he could remember. Easy for you to say, he retorted, because as near as he could tell, he was doing the majority of the heavy lifting. After managing the tight stairwell, they spilled out into the garden and set their burden down for a brief respite. It looks just like the old guy, offered her brother. Oh, I see. The gardener is now an art expert. Resuming their work, they headed toward the back garden where a cheerful orange glow was illuminating the gloomy dark and the surrounding camellia shrubs. The blaze had been kindled by the young man an hour ago after the Churchills had long fallen asleep and the flames were licking upward with impressive robustness. Young men are never happier than when given permission to set something afire, and he felt a certain thrill, possibly that of an arsonist. 
when they heaved the large canvas on top of the blaze. What happened next unsettled them both. The portrait was lit beautifully from beneath and it almost seemed as if the man himself were atop the pyre. But then the destruction began. A flame pierced through the canvas in the upper corner, throwing additional light onto Churchill's face, and the two onlookers gasped. They suddenly felt that they were destroying something of great value, definitely irreplaceable, and their consciences ignited along with the painting. That they were not people with power. Their lot in life was to serve, and so with the assurance that they were doing precisely what they had been ordered to do, they watched the image illuminate, briefly come to life, and then turn to ash. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. Uh, again, Donna's essay in full uh, can be read with the fall issue of the journal which you can find online. All right, next up we have uh, representing the international contingent of the AGLSP. We have Erin Holbrook of Simon Fraser University. Uh, her essay is called The First Time I Met Dionysus. Uh, and this was published in the fall 2020 issue of the journal. Erin. Thanks, Stephen. Hello everyone, thanks for having me, great to be here. Um, so this piece I wrote in my very first class in GLS at Simon Fraser University. Um, it's actually a piece of creative nonfiction. Um, it was written uh, as an assignment to take a, an episode from our personal life, our history, and rewrite it through the lens of uh, one or more of the texts that we read that term. And so this piece is a true story and it is uh, rewritten uh, through the lens of Euripides, the Bacchae and Nietzsche's The Birth of Tragedy. All right. Spider Hill Road winds along a mountainside of thick evergreen forest on the west coast of British Columbia. Somewhere along that road sits an abandoned shack where teens gather to drink beer, make out, or play acoustic guitar riffs by the dim light of a propane lantern. The people who live along this road work at the rock quarry or at the hydroelectric plant on the nearby lake. Their kids wait for the school bus to pick them up early in the morning when the moon is still in the sky. It was an evening in late October, 1993, when I first saw Spider Hill. William was in his final year of high school. I was in the grade below him. William was moody, but dependable, an only child like me. We were serious, mercurial, and often lonely. I lived one town over in a suburban bedroom community where the street lines came on reassuringly at dusk. Any mention of Spider Hill in my town would conjure up images of thrill-seeking locals speeding down the narrow, winding road in pickup trucks. The unluckiest among them would miss the turn and flip over in a ditch or end up crumpled against the thick trunk of a cedar tree. Some of their names were printed in the local paper or on the back page of the high school yearbook. That night in 93, I waited at the edge of my driveway for William to pick me up. He phoned me up earlier that day, said he was taking me to a party somewhere up in the woods. He sounded nervous, careless, out of breath. I knew not to ask too many questions. If I did, he would change his plans and I'd be stuck at home on a Saturday night. William pulled up as the street lights flickered on. He opened the passenger side door from the inside. Ready, he asked. For what, I answered sardonically. He was quiet as we drove along the highway towards Spider Hill Road in his mom's ancient rusted out pickup. He held onto the steering wheel with a focused determination, navigating sharp turns and dodging potholes beneath a canopy of evergreens and cottonwood. I stared out the window in silence as we passed a row of roadside memorials. Some were decorated with flowers, other bore faintly carved initials on rain-weathered Polaroids. We turned up a long gravel driveway that ended at a modest log cabin. An orderly crew was tending a massive bonfire in the middle of a grass field. They moved through the smoke in a blur of plaid flannel jackets, jeans, dirty work boots. According to William, the place belonged to a relative, an older cousin or uncle, I can't remember which. There was a barn to our right, and although they were mostly hidden in their stalls, 
I could see puffs of steam erupting from several horses' nostrils as we passed. On the field, a few dozen people moved about purposefully, tending the fire or raking up leaves. We pulled over and parked beside the barn, stepping out onto the path as a slender white figure appeared, leaping like a fawn out of the darkness, taking us both by surprise. This was the first time I met Dionysus. My eyes adjusted to the light of his lantern as his shape began to materialize. Shoulder-length golden ringlets spiraled gently against a sharp, moon-pale face. He had the spry gait of a gazelle and the proud stance of a Greek satyr. A loose, multicolored scarf draped carelessly behind him. Black leather boots curled up slightly at the toes, part Mephistopheles, part Robin Goodfellow. Dionysus leaned in closer to William and me, grinning madly as if he were about to share a terrible secret. Are you here for the party? Whatever the case, I'm so glad you've come. It's going to be awesome, like nothing you've seen. He was only a few years older than us, but spoke with a confidence and authorities that suggested he was in charge. I looked at William questioningly. He shrugged and looked away. Dionysus mentioned for, motioned for us to follow him towards the bonfire. The fire was almost as tall as the trees that lined the property. I sat next to William and Dionysus on a freshly cut tree stump and made small talk with strangers in the dark. In my thin satin jacket, they must have thought that I was either brave or unprepared. It was the latter. They explained that this bonfire was an annual tradition. After a few hours of burning, hot coals would be raked over the field. Then everyone would take a turn walking across the coals barefoot. Dionysus turned to me. Have you ever walked on fire? We do it every year. It's a tradition around here. I shook my head but it took me a moment to fully process the question. My eyes widened as the flames crackled. He must have sensed my hesitation. Don't worry. First, I'll be guiding us in a group meditation. Then we will all walk together. There's nothing to fear. Just let go of your mind and you're free. You'll see. His tone was casual, but my mind was racing, looking for an escape. This wasn't what I had expected. I started to stand up an inch away from the fire, but William stepped behind me and blocked my retreat. He tried to reassure me. Don't worry, I've seen it before on TV. It's just like mind over matter or whatever, he offered. I wasn't persuaded. One by one, the chorus of flannel figures gave their speeches. Someone passed me a warm beer. But you came all this way. You must give it a try. There's nothing to fear. It'll be an experience you'll never forget. You can watch if you want, but you'll be sorry to miss out. The wind changed direction and the smoke from the fire bellowed towards me. My eyes burned. The smoke obscured the scene like a heavy curtain. Backlit by the fire, the voices of the choir seemed to be coming from all directions. A dozen shadows crowded around, their voices hovering in the smoke-filled air. You can trust him. You can trust Dionysus. We do it every year. It's our tradition. Stepping out of the circle of voices, I wanted to explain something, but my words wouldn't come together. Dionysus stood up and held his lantern high in his left hand. A hush came over the crowd. The hovering shadows became solid figures again and assembled around their leader. He explained that he would be leading everyone up to the cabin for instructions and a guided meditation. I turned to William. This is crazy, I whispered to him sharply. These people are crazy. You didn't tell me that this was going to happen. I thought we were just coming up for a party. William turned and looked at me with the same determination I had seen in him earlier that evening. You wouldn't have come if I told you. He was right, of course, but I was still angry. We were quiet for a few minutes. You don't have to do it, he sighed. I'll stay here with you. I exhaled for the first time in what felt like hours, releasing a long puff of steam into the cold air. Thank you, I said, as I turned away from him and watched the assembly of Bacchae walk up the driveway towards the cabin's warm glow. Dionysus followed behind them with his lantern held high above his head. I shivered in the darkness. William came up behind me and placed his flannel jacket around my shoulders. A few of the initiates stayed behind to rake hot coals across the field. I'm sure there were a lot of reasons why I didn't follow Dionysus to the cabin. One thing, I didn't trust him. 
I was also too skeptical, too rigid. Admittedly, I was afraid of anything I couldn't understand rationally. Walking on hot coals without feeling any pain, it didn't make sense, and I was sure I would fail if I tried it. Dionysus's followers, on the other hand, were instinctively confident, confident that mind could transcend matter. What did that even mean? It wasn't logical. I watched the fire and waited with William in silence. 20 minutes later, Dionysus and his initiates emerged from the cabin, marching in a line, chanting in unison to the beat of a drum. Where do you wave your thyrsus over your wish worshippers, O Dionysus? Perhaps in those thick wood woods of Mount Olympus, where Orpheus once played his lyre, brought trees together with his songs, collecting wild beasts around him. William and I stood at the edge of the field, observing their hypnotic, coordinated movements from a comfortable distance. At Dionysus's signal, the figures began walking across the burning field, the legs of their jeans rolled up to their shins. They moved across the coal swiftly, as if carried along by a strong wind. They continued their chanting. The pulsing of the drum seemed to be the only thing keeping time moving forward. The voices of the chorus lifted into the trees. Steam rising up from the hot coals hovered over the scene like a gossamer veil. Caught in the swell of the dithyrambic chorus, my sense of time slowed and seemed to fold in on itself. As I stood watching Dionysus lead his initiates, one by one, over the burning coals, I felt like a stranger from a distant country. They walked across the field with joy, without hesitation, without fear, and celebrated their journey to the far side with cheering and ecstatic dancing. The drum beat louder, the voice of the chorus swelled. Dionysus was in there somewhere, swallowed up in the leveling frenzy of the crowd. Listening to those multiplied voices unified in celebration, I was awestruck by this coming together of spirit, this voluntary surrendering of the self to something bigger and more profound. I found myself wanting to be a part of it, to follow the lead of that charismatic guide, to lose myself in the chorus. But by then it was too late. They had already crossed over to the other side and the ritual was over. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, just to remind you, that was uh, published in the fall 2020 issue of the journal. Um, and so if you don't know, if you go to the journal's website, which again is confluence or www.confluence-hlsp.org and Kim has twice now so graciously pasted into the chat. Thank you, Kim. Um, from that main page, if you look to the right of the page, you will see links to uh, past issues. Uh, and if you click on that, you'll be able to see every issue that has been published since 2016, uh, which was when I was lucky enough to uh, take over the journal. So everything that you have heard and will hear the rest of the evening, everything is published and you'll be able to find it pretty easily if you go to that part of the uh, journal website. Thank you again, um, Aaron. Next, uh, we have Cynthia Lee from Arizona State University. Um, Cynthia's essay is called, uh, Am I a Conditional American? This was published in the fall 2021 issue of the journal. And it was actually uh, one of the writing award winners for that year. If you don't know, the AGLSP sponsors two writing awards each year for the journal, uh, one in interdisciplinary writing and one in creative writing. And students or recent graduates of programs are eligible for these awards. And basically what happens is uh, faculty members or program directors will nominate students and their work for these awards. The nominations come in and they are judged and we pick one winner in each category. Uh, and again, Cindy's essay won the Creative Writing Award for, uh, for 2021. So we're uh, super pleased that, that Cindy can join us and read this essay. Cindy? Thank you, Dr. Burr. So um, this essay is the result of an encounter I had in spring of 2020. So it was the beginning of the pan beginnings of the pandemic. It was a tumultuous time and um, lots of uncertainty. 
And so this essay is a result of um, my reflections on what it means to be an American. I stood in line outside of Target, masked before 8 a.m. Others were ahead and behind me, socially distanced six feet apart, queued up alongside the building. A man holding a jacket walked toward me, heading to the end of the line. He saw me, jammed the jacket up into his face to cover his nose and mouth, then stomped away from me, determined to create a wide berth. I was at this Target in Scottsdale, Arizona, hoping to score a single container of disinfecting wipes. This was the early days of the COVID-19 emergency and toilet paper and hand sanitizer had disappeared from stores. This white man acted as though I were diseased. Is he germ phobic in general, I wondered, or is he reacting to my being Asian? I turned around to watch him pass the others. He had dropped the jacket down again, carrying it at his side, moving closer to the line of people. I was stunned. I am not the coronavirus. I'm an American. I was born in the United States to Korean parents who had come to America for their college education. My father had arrived in California in 1948, just after the end of World War II. He experienced some anti-Japanese racism, but he over overcame this. My parents married, became naturalized US citizens, had children and raised us here. If you speak with an Asian accent as my parents do, some people treat you like you're deaf or stupid or both. It was annoying to witness my parents being treated with disrespect, although it didn't happen to me. People can tell from my voice that I'm American. In a Korean American family like mine, you receive specific messaging at home. Always do your best. I expect no less from you girls than I do from the boys. Give back to society. And if you behave badly in public, you bring shame on the whole family. The whole family? I'm just a kid, I thought. But I understood what my father meant. He wanted us to do our Korean heritage proud and he wanted us to be good citizens. We followed all the rules as a, an Asian American family could embrace to become assimilated. My father chose modest homes in high property tax districts. So public education was the best in the area. We children excelled in school. We watched TV, Bonanza, Rawhide, I Dream of Jeannie. We got Domino's pizza and McDonald's as a treat. We ate Betty Crocker's Hamburger Helper with rice. We participated in community activities and did not get into trouble. I was a cheerleader in junior high and high school and volunteered and a volunteer candy striper at our local hospital. I went door to door collecting sponsors each year to raise money for the Walk for Mankind. I grew up in white suburban neighborhoods feeling comfortably American and inconspicuous. This was sometimes called being a banana, yellow on the outside, white on the inside. But we are products of our environment. When you're a kid, you don't choose where you grow up. I was the only non-white kid in my third grade class, although I never realized this until I was an adult seeing the group class photo. You don't feel different if you're not made to feel different. It just wasn't in my psyche. As a kid in school, I didn't visually see myself. My identity was defined by what my community looked like, but also by their interactions with me. My family and I were the model minority living the American dream. There were hiccups, of course. The summer after my senior year of college, some friends and I rented a house together in New Haven, Connecticut. We threw an outdoor barbecue party and invited other friends. I knew nothing about grilling. Apparently, I did something wrong while trying to help. No, you stupid Jap! One of my housemates blurted. I was startled, speechless. Rick was a tall, blonde, handsome Yale student studying engineering. In a moment of unguarded frustration, this well-educated young man went for the racial slur. And I'm not even Japanese. Periodically since then, I've been reminded that I'm seen as other. There's the occasional well-intentioned comment from an elderly woman. You speak English beautifully. Sometimes the reminder is more blatant. One day in the 1990s, my husband and I were arguing and I stormed out of the Los Angeles apartment. 
A Century City shopping mall with a movie theater was mere blocks away, so I planned to see a movie to get out and settle down. As I waited on the corner for the light to change, a car pulled up. The front and back passenger windows rolled down, revealing a car full of young white men. The man in front uttered a version of a ching chong ching chong. In 2009, my husband and I moved from New York to Arizona, specifically to Scottsdale, where the population of the city is about 88% white. I became enga an engaged member of my community, serving on the city of Scottsdale's Historic Preservation Commission and participating in local action and activism. Then the pandemic struck. By late March, 2020, the coronavirus had taken our reality hostage, creating fear, anger, and confusion. Some politicians and commentators began calling COVID-19 the China virus or Kung flu, including the Scottsdale City Council member who voted yes on my city commission appointment. The experience at Target forced me to rethink everything. A white man rudely covering his face and escaping from me because of my face, my race. Some things you can't unsee or unfeel. I thought of my sister Angie with her two, with her three sons, all minors, in the elevator of a hotel in Anaheim, California in late February. The elevator doors had opened. A woman started to step in. She looked up, saw four Asian faces, hesitated and stepped out. I thought of my friend, Tony, who is black. He and his white wife live in a residential neighborhood in Los Angeles. When Tony would stroll down the streets alone, people would not greet him and sometimes he crossed the road. After he and his wife got a fluff, fluffy, friendly puppy last year, Tony said he never had so many people approach and engage him as when he took the dog out for a walk. One day, Tony's friend, a young black man, came over. They went out together with the dog. People were wary of them as they walked along the streets. Tony remarked to me later, friendly puppy makes a black man not scary, but two black men together cancel out the cute dog. Tony wears pinstripe dress shirts when he goes out of the house, so he looks less threatening, more like he belongs there. After the Target episode with the man's extreme reaction to my Asian face, I started wearing Scottsdale mom type clothes so I looked clean, more relatable, less foreign. I felt the need to wear a uniform to be less conspicuous, that somehow the familiar suburban clothes might restore me to model minority status instead of Kung flu carrier of disease. Since the COVID-19 pandemic began, news and social media have just described thousands of anti-Asian hate crimes committed across the United States. Immigration policies and attitudes have become even more nativist. Breonna Taylor and George Floyd were killed by police, the latest victims in a relentless history of lethal systemic racism. Black Lives Matter protests overwhelmingly seized our consciousness. White supremacists have taken up arms. I now understand, not viscerally, not just intellectually, what it feels like to feel afraid for how I look, to worry about people reacting irrationally to my face, to my race, my ethnicity. It's one thing to know it exists in the United States. I couldn't live here growing up during the civil rights movement of the 60s, live in Arizona and not know it. It's another thing to experience it firsthand, to really feel it. As a child in school, I learned that settlers in the United States had killed Native Americans. I learned that the Japanese in America were interned after the bombing of Pearl Harbor. I thought, we Americans did that, we. I identified with US history, even though my Korean ancestors had not been responsible. And when Neil Armstrong was the first person to step foot on the moon saying, that's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind, I proudly felt as an American. We did that. But in practice, the truth is that we is not always we. My lived experience had not prepared me for this disillusionment and hurt. At 64 years old, I've come to realize that my safety is conditional. My acceptance is conditional. My Americanness is conditional. 
The rules are not up to those of us who are other. Despite how we feel, who we are, or what we've done, someone else gets to decide whether we are dangerous, diseased, or even American. The American dream can be bestowed and it can be withdrawn. Now the American dream is less dreamy for me, less sure. For too many, it's never been. Thank you, Cindy. Again, if you want to read Cindy's essay, you can find it in the fall 2021 issue. Um, and probably it should be pretty clear to all of you why this won the award uh, for creative writing for 2021. Thank you, Cindy. Uh, our, our final reader for this evening is uh, Jordi Rosenman of St. John's College in Annapolis. And Jordi will be reading two poems for us, uh, Teaching Fire and Water and Winter Glistening. And both of these poems were published in the spring 2020 issue of the journal. Um, Jordy. Thank you, Stephen. Um, and thank you everyone for sharing your, your wonderful writing. Um, I guess I would just say about this one, I it had been a while since I looked at these. Um, as Stephen said, they were published in 2020. Um, and this one that I'm about to read is the first poem that I ever wrote down. Um, it's also the longest poem I ever wrote. And it it's about mainly about my memories of my first year of teaching. And I just laughed when I read it because it, it just sounds like somebody who hadn't found yoga yet, which is true. And what I mean by that is somebody who didn't know how to do things with detachment, like with love, but with detachment. And I really felt like as a first year teacher, you know, if, if the kids weren't like burning with enthusiasm every second of every day, I didn't know what to do with that. So, so here is, uh, and I actually have a teacher here right now. So that's fun, a former teacher. Hi, Jen. Um, this is dedicated to teachers everywhere. Teaching fire and water. Some days, they stare at you, eager and listening, waiting, following, silent. The classroom, though they might as well be chirping, their mouths open, waiting for worms, warm from fresh earth. And so now they're with you, with each other, and with their own mind all at once. And their eyes move with you a little bit because there's something going on behind them, moving, worrying. They follow your steps and pick up the worms in the wake, those words, warm with the heat of the fire they came from, not the earth, but my heart, full of fire, so that the words burn in me, but somewhere between me and those open mouths, there's a cooling off, so that by the time the words drop into those mouths and those eyes, those minds, I hope there's still steam so they can feel the fire they came from. And you can feel the difference between silence, confused, absent, blank, and the blanket of a silence that holds magic. You can feel that silence immediately, warm, the soft quilt silence of a wisdom just found together. We are all there because of it we are bound and we are gazing at it together from just a few steps ahead of it in awe, in communion. You step into that hush or else it falls on you all, that silence breathes in and out, winking, it lives. You can feel that. You can reach out your hand and touch that kind of silk silence in the places where the stars aren't peeking through it. And you hold so as not to move out from under it. It is sacred. And some days you come home buzzing, just buzzing with the vibrations of the noises and silences of that day. And you have to lie in your bed with your eyes closed, but your mind spinning, spinning for half an hour before enough of it has seeped out of you to be able to speak with anyone before your heartbeats return, normal. You have to lie in your bed, eyes closed, mind moving before you've come down enough even to be still and rest there. But some days they stare at you and it's different and they are not with you and they do not jump in, but resist. And you have to pull them 
and they resent the whole way pulling, taut. And on these days, initially, there's no one else there, just you and the words. And you have to pull and pull and sometimes it works. And one by one, you can feel them slipping in around you and they join and they are inevitably happy once they get there. It cannot be otherwise. The turn is immediate, no matter the length, the strength of the pulling. And they smile and are full and they wave at you and at each other as they slip in one by one and you can feel it gathering around you and you let go and look around and relax and smile and breathe. But some days, they are not resistant, but gone. Some days you can get them. Most days you can get them. But some days they want you to do it all on your own and they watch and they do not slip in, but the entire spark, if one is to be made, rests on the power of your own vitality. It has to fill the room, wide, loud. It doesn't matter what they feel. It doesn't matter what you feel. Every day you have to burn. And how to start, how to step off into that space, away from your comfort, into a pain, tense, for it hurts, and it will, and it must, if it means that much, that way is the only, every day, and it's hard. And the spark, yours, turns, waiting, working, burning, to flare into flame, and you are alone, a mountain, sweating, dripping raindrops into the sea that surrounds you. The storm is so loud inside you, but the silence outside is profound, and you think, where are they? And if only one would reveal that they yearn. I know it, I know it, but show. And you think it's too much to need that each day. Concerning your gut, where's the worth? And the worms now just wriggle, they squirm. But a friend, inadvertent, reminds me that what is to give light must endure the burning. And I think, okay, I can burn and burn and burn and shine. And some days it's me in the dark. But some days, when the lightning strikes, I grab it, and the storm passes, and in the light, we are versed. So that was one, <laughs> that was my longest poem that I ever wrote. Um, thank you. I guess I'll just read the second one now. Yeah, okay. Uh, all right, this one is not about teaching. This is called Winter Glistening. Walking at night with my dad over the top layer of snow, hardened and hushed in the night. So smooth, so delicate, that I could crunch it into glittering pieces silently into the soft snow below and the sparkle from the solitary lamppost between my friend's home and my own is all I could see when I looked down across the vast expanse of snow between our houses, glittering, glittering, white snow and black sky. And every step I took in my boots, a bundle of scarf and a frozen nose in the quiet night, holding its breath for the crystalline sake of the stars, crunched right through to the powder beneath, every step. And after one, I looked up at my dad, how could this one swift footfall, soft and small, satisfy everything you needed? So wild to strike right to the core of the earth and me. And if I held my body up gentle and careful, I could suspend myself on top of the smooth surface and even glide a little, but the slightest bit of weight cracked right through that sheet. And then of course, a stomp, quiet and deep, shot perfect tracks three inches down across this alien landscape, normally my home, stretching out in the dark, glittering, glittering blue and silver, sequins sprinkled under the lamppost, which paired with the purple rim of the dark sky and the silence full of something, hinted right to my heart at something. What time was it? I do not know. It felt as late as the universe suspended. Thank you, Jordy. So 
that is the last of the formal part of the program. Um, Kim, do we have time to go on a little bit longer with questions and discussion and such? Sure, we, we don't have an end time. Anybody that wants to stay is welcome to join in. Okay. Um, before we get into that, there are just two things that I would like to say. I think just two things. Um, one, first and foremost, tremendous thank yous to our readers. Um, I think that it should be pretty clear why these works were published and why these writers were invited to share their work in this more public forum. And I want to point out that um, to submit work for publication is a risk, right? It's a vulnerable position to put yourself in. And it's a whole other sort of level of vulnerability to come into a public forum like this and to read that work. Um, and I'm grateful to each of you for being willing to share your work, first of all, with the journal, um, and then to be here this evening and to share your work with us. So thank you all of you very, very much uh, for doing that. Um, the second thing that I wanted to say is I hope that everybody here is sort of, um, you know, inspired. Um, maybe you have something that you have written or that you're currently writing or that you want to write. Um, and perhaps you might at some point like to share it with the journal. Um, if that is the case, I hope that you will visit the site um, confluence.aglsp.org. You will find, if you look at the top menu, you will see instructions for authors. Um, and that will tell you what you need to do to submit. It's a pretty easy process. Um, and we're pretty nice people when it comes to um, appreciating the work that we receive. So that is it for me. Um, what questions do any of you have? What comments do you have? Um, I trust that we can just sort of keep this informal and you know, just kind of say what you're thinking as you're thinking it rather than trying to do this in an orderly fashion of some kind or other. Uh, so yeah, let's just open it up. I don't wanna discourage anyone from asking questions, but I do wanna chime in that we hope this makes you um, interested not only in the journal, but as part of our conference, we do a story slam. Mm -hmm. So a lot of these presentations reminded me of some of the ones we've uh, had before. So you could have an opportunity to come to San Diego and share your uh, stories in a friendly competitive format. And I'm gonna also drop in the link for the conference so that you can hopefully make plans to come and join us, whether you present for one of the other panels or the story slam. Um, Brian? Oh. Hey, Donna. Um, Brian, your poetry, uh, like, so I hope you will take this in the right way because I can't think of anybody who I adore more that reminds me of your poetry as a cross between um, Tony Hoagland and Billy Collins. Um, because it's contemporary, but it's it's so deep. And it reminded me each, I don't know how you have the poem section, but the further you got into the poem, the more I felt like I had I had concocted something that, you know, you put in a bowl and you mix it and it starts looking like something. And then you put it in the refrigerator and a day later, it's better. And a day later, there's nothing left and you're missing it. That was, it was really great. Like that whole poem was such a great ride and I appreciate it. I, I also was gonna Thank tell you, Brian, that I, um, I've lived in Texas my whole life and was born down in Uvalde and I feel like you captured Texas very well. <laughs> Thank you both, I really appreciate that. I was trying to find a nice balance of events and other kinds of engagement. Um, yeah, I appreciate um, Brian, I would just add to their comments about your work, like listening, listening to you like reflect on having to deal with the personal and the global at the same time. I always just think like that's one of the weirdest parts of human 
life. Um, and it was really, especially right now, um, it was really nice to hear that <laughs> from someone else. Thank you, I really appreciate it. Um, and Brian, yeah. I really like the humor that you incorporated into that poem and in, in your reading. I was glad that I was mute because you would have heard me who all times. Yeah, I find that's a nice way to help break up some of the heavier topics is to exactly. just sprinkle in some humor, not necessarily in an organized fashion, but um, just little lines here and there to give a little reprieve. What else do we have? I mean, I could ask some really cliche questions if that's what we're going to come to. I'd like to, to compliment Cindy. So uh, your reading really hit close to home for me. My wife is an immigrant from China. And one of the things that's often shocking that I thought you expressed wonderfully is the surprising moments when racism shows up when you wouldn't expect, I mean, you never expect it, but like now, you know, and, and while, and it's always foolish, but the, the stupidity of, you know, calling you a Jap at a moment with a grill issue so it's shocking the racism showed up. It's shocking the specific nature of the racism. So I love that you hit that. I mean, it made, it made me really uncomfortable as I thought about things that she's experienced. So just well done, well written. Thank you. Cindy, I would hope you'd rebel and be an other. There is nothing, I just don't know why anybody would want to be grouped in with the normal and the mundane. I think other is fabulous in the say you see you stated that you feel like that or you're made to feel like that. And I just think other is cool. I mean I can't think of anyone group that really rocks like it used to, you know, not since all my California hippies are gone. Shut up, Roberto. Um yeah, I mean that's like you're fabulous. I don't I just can't imagine you anybody having the power to make you feel any other than who you really are and your expressiveness and your your self-reflection is an indication that you rise above so let other be other because it's pretty cool you know the whole uh notion of being other is i mean we all are unique and special and we have gifts and um we're, you know, serious and funny. And so we're lots of, we have lots of dimensions, but the idea of other is when someone puts you there. So we put ourselves into, um, I'm independent or I'm creative or I'm not good enough of a writer or what, you know, whatever, but it's when somebody else gets to decide what you are. So that's the part that's not okay. Or that's, um, as uh, Glenn said, surprising because you're going along thinking, you know, I'm like everybody else, but I'm me. And then someone goes, yeah, no, actually, no, you're not because it's COVID and, you know, we're all concerned about people who look like you or something. So it's, um, yeah, it's surprising. And I don't mind being other in all the other ways, <laughs> as long as someone doesn't overlay something over on me that is not for them to say or do. I mean, that's exactly it, right? I mean, it's one thing to to walk around in the world and to feel like you're different and to sort of identify yourself in different ways because you have that sort of power and that authority to do it. But when somebody else does so, there's almost an inherent negativity to it, almost an inherent like looking down, like I've decided that you're something different, you're something other. And in that determination, I have necessarily determined that there's something negative about that. And it's it's a it's taking away autonomy. It's taking away your power to define who you are and what you are for the world.
Thanks, um, Mr. Roberto. Um, I'd like to um, address uh, Donna's piece, and I, it's, I, I love this so much. Uh, I must confess, the first time I read it, and I tried to read it in um, uh, San Antonio when I was given a copy of Confluence, I, you know, I read a couple of pages, then put it aside. I, it just wasn't the right time. Um, and then I picked it up again, maybe two weeks ago, and I just love it so much simply because what you did is hard. I mean, you have different perspectives coming in, um, organs having an opinion. Um, it just, uh, it just, just, you, you, you did a phenomenal job. And I'm sorry. I mean, I, I, I'm fond of the subject matter of, of one time was really, I spent a lot of time reading about Churchill and stuff. And, um, I, I, I don't know. I don't even have the right words for this. Um, also, I just like some of your turns of phrases, like calling his thoughts as if in taffy. I love that because I can, I can see it. I can just see it, thoughts just being gooey and having a hard time going from one place to the next. And also, dendritic. You really, you pull a word like, usually I don't have to look up words, but you, I had to look that one up. So anyway, I just, I'm so proud of you. You did a great job and thank you, I was spoken enough. <laughs> and I love you too, Dee. Thank you. Thank you for saying so. Um, just uh, thinking about words um, in the previous comment. So, Jordi, I'll just say that the transition from the first poem to the second poem, the word delicate, uh, the delicate snow was in the was in the one of the first few lines of the second poem. But then I, I spent a minute um, or some seconds thinking back about the delicacy of the different kinds of silences that you were talking about. And something about that juxtaposition just had a lot of texture for me. I learned, I learned from the best. So I have to say that there is no way, and I won't use any foul language, but boy, it's on the tip of my tongue, but there is no way that chat GPT or any other automated anything can compare with watching y'all's faces and watching the emotion come over your face and hearing the true history of what got you to write what you wrote can be duplicated. So thank you guys for being real. I second that for sure. As I said, this is a vulnerable thing to do as a, as a writer and as a reader. Um, and for my money, you all knock it out of the park. May I just say that it's a privilege to come and be part of this group and to share our work. Um, you, we labor over it and we put ourselves into it. And so when we're able to present it and um, give it air and give it life, it's really um, a joy for us. I think we might have to do this again. Well, we've been at this for uh, not quite an hour and 15. Um, are there any other questions or, or comments or anything else that anyone would like to share? I, I, I don't want to cut anyone off. Kim, did you want to say anything further about um, submissions for the conference or anything else? No, I'm good. I just want to um, reiterate what others said. I just really enjoyed everyone's presentation. 
it's really much more enjoyable to listen to an author read their work than to read it myself. I just don't have that same visual skill in my head. Um, and I do hope we do this again. And I really want to thank not just the presenters, but all the people that uh, came and attended our evening event. So thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, all the presenters. And, and thank all the attendees as well. Yeah, I second all of that. Again, uh, thank you, Amy, for the for the idea to do this. Um, and thank you, Kim and Rebecca, for making it all happen. And this is being recorded, so we'll have it available uh, after we edit a little, and um, we'll have it on the Confluence site and on the HLSP website. And if you can't find it, send us an email, and I'll send you how to find it. Awesome. Thank you, Kim. Good night, everybody. Uh, Thank you all very much for taking time this evening. Uh, thanks especially to the readers, but thank you all for, for being here and participating. Take care, everyone.